I'd like to share with you a very, very basic framework that can be used in any situation because one time after teaching for 36 years or 40 years, I asked myself this question. No? In my effort to practice with mindfulness, because I'm a mindfulness practitioner, as a scientist practitioner, I asked a basic question. Why do people do what they do? Aside from reflecting on my own experience and sifting through the complex psychological theories, I'm reading this, and researches, I, de and de I decided to go back to basics. Hence, this simple book on the seven basic psychological needs. I hope it helps you gain a clearer understanding of your own needs as faculty, your own needs as student, and those of the people around you. Because with understanding comes compassion. What I'd like to do is, as I talk about each need, introspect, no? think of your own self, apply it to your own self, because it's, it's a very uh, applicable framework. Okay. Uh, it's been used uh, for hospitals, for our corporations, parenting, schools, uh, teachers, students, all over. You know? So I, found, I wanted to get a very, very basic framework. So that's why the first need that I, I identified is I call the need for personal significance. The need for every one of us, each one of us, young and old, infant until old age, is to know that I matter. I make a difference. I am not a non-entity. An infant needs, especially a human infant, needs another human being for that infant to survive. So an infant matters, must matter to at least one other human being for just their survival. No? Of course, there are other things that happen there, the warmth, the affection, and all that. But the other thing is, in adolescence, this is where we ask. We, because we think maybe that uh, at a certain age, it's OK. I mean, I don't matter. Or adolescents might say, it's OK. I'm going out of the house. It doesn't matter to me. But the truth is, in adolescence, it matters to them. What matters to them is that their family thinks that they are OK and that they are not trouble some to the family and that they are pleasing their parents. Whether they admit it or not, it's so important for them not to be a disappointment to their parents. In my clinical practice, most of the uh, depression and, and the problems I see is that the adolescents or the young people feel that they have disappointed their parents. And it's a very, very painful feeling to have, no? to a point where sometimes there are suicidal uh, attempts or, and all that. So, the adolescent must know that he or she matters in his family, especially to his parents, whether they show it or not. Sometimes they don't show it. They're very indifferent in the outside, but inside they long to know that they are important and they are not disappointing their parents. And then as you get older and work as a teacher, as a corporate worker, if you are a boss, it's very important to know, to make your people know that each one of them matters. Because it's true that each one of them matters. Everybody must matter where they are. And they must know that they matter. They make a difference. And as they get older, in my old age right now, 70s, uh, <laughs> it's, the question is, how did I make a difference in this world? Or if not, what difference do I want to make in my life on Earth? My life will not be in vain if I made a difference maybe in the child's life, if maybe I made a difference in the lives of some young people, then that's how I know that I matter. And I always say that the worst thing you can do to another human being is to treat that person as a non-entity. Whatever that person does, doesn't matter. So I had a patient, there was an adolescent, who knew how to drive, secretly knew how to drive. Anyway, just to show you, he was acting out. He was not coming home on time. He was not doing his homework. And he was uh, very, very uh, angry. 
but uh, the father who was very very busy was not doing anything about it so one day he got the favorite car of the father and drove it to the ditch and the father got so mad and got out of his office and went there to see what happened that is how he mattered to the father sadly you know? that is how he made a dent pun intended <laughs> in the father's <laughs> father's life so children and even adults will do anything especially children to make to make them know that they matter in the classroom for example a child will do something that's really a wrong behavior no misbehavior punished then he does it again, he gets punished, does it again, gets punished. Well, he's it. Does he want to get punished? No, maybe there's a deeper need. Maybe he wants to know that he exists. That what he does affects the teacher, affects someone. What he does matters. It's not that nobody cares. I think the bottom line is when nobody cares, that's when you know that you don't matter in this world anyway, why exist? So I might as well not exist. Anyway, so think about it. How do you want to matter to your student if you're the teacher? How do you want to matter to your children? Or how does this child, as a child, how do you want to matter to your parents? And how do you want to matter in this world? Okay, so next one is, of course, affection. But, you know, uh, I just want to emphasize here that no matter how much you have achieved as a human being we still need affirmation especially from people who are important to us love of course affection is a basic basic need we all know that no? and so many things happen because a person feels he was not given love and you know love it's the greatest thing anyway so uh, but what we want to see to emphasize here also is unconditional acceptance. Okay, because in a family, we want to know, we want to feel that whatever we have done wrong, whatever we have done right, whatever, whatever, however we look, we look good, we don't look good, we don't look like the other children, etc. We still want to feel that we are accepted as we are. And I think that's a basic need. So those young people, the other songs, I love you for who you are. Be who you are, and I'll unconditionally accept you. Unconditional acceptance is something we probably don't get anymore when we get older. No, we get it probably when we're young. We, um, as a baby, no matter what you look like, you're fed and clothed, and then when you get older, uh, no, you won't get this if you don't get 90. You know, there are already a lot of conditions, which is normal. But even as these conditions are normal and we fulfill them, even as we get older, even as old as old <laughs> age, we still want to feel at least an experience with maybe just at least one person who accepts us unconditionally. You probably have a friend or somebody whom you can tell everything to, whom you can show all your weaknesses to, and you know that you will not be rejected. That's a very basic need that we all have. Now, two, we accepted for who we are, as as habinilang warts and all, everything. So that's something we long for, and sometimes we don't get. So that's why also in psychotherapy, psychologists provide that atmosphere of unconditional acceptance. No matter what you say, you're angry, you're angry at your parents, etc. I accept you. I validate your feeling. It doesn't mean you're going to act on it, but you have a right to feel what you're feeling. And I accept it without judgment. Some people are very nasty all the time, etc. Sometimes they just need some kind of affirmation. And you know, several people now, without a, a little criticism, will make them very, very aggressive, very angry, and, and really uh, impulsive, you know? But given affirmation, the person feels, feels good about himself. But, very important, affirmation must be genuine. It must not be used to manipulate the situation. And people know if you are 
making bola <laughs> or your affirmation is true and genuine. So that's the important thing, especially for children. Because children uh, discern the truth not because of what you say, not because of your words, but because of the totality of who you are, how your eyes look, how your body is, etc. They catch the truth, the authenticity. So when I was training, which I've been training clinical psychologists for like more than three decades, I will say, if you really want thorough training, have time to work with children, because children force you to be authentic. They know when you're pretending. We need clear and consistent limits, uh, which is translated to discipline. No? I put here we need to know our limits. We need to know when to take a break. That's for us, let's say teachers, people who work. But actually, we, all of us need discipline. Okay, I think this is one of the, most, the hottest topic when you talk about raising children, when you talk about parenting. No? Just a brief thing about it. Two years ago, or was it last year, during our anniversary, our topic was the power of compassionate discipline. Because when we go out as a team in the uh, barangays, we notice, we observe something very common. I don't know if you observe it. It's that when, pe when parents punish or discipline their children, it goes with the mura or a spanking. But hindi mo ginawayan, ang tamad-tamad mo. Why you do that? Ang tangam. You know, it's like natural. And for them, we, we discovered that for them, it's okay because it's natural. But the effect on the self-concept of the child is not considered. So what we wanted was, and besides when you discipline, you punish, you hurt, which of course we have a law against that already, but there's a more important reason why we it, first of all, when you do punishment that's harsh, it instills some kind of resentment, and the child may tend to imitate it. But more importantly, it is not long-lasting, and it is not integrated in the self of the child. So that when, when the driver is driving and there's no policeman, you can go through a red light. In other words, it seems that, <laughs> it seems that culturally our discipline is not self-discipline but discipline that needs an outside force to stop us from doing what should not be done. But compassionate discipline is the opposite. Compassionate discipline is discipline wherein the child is treated with respect and the rule is explained to the child or the student so the student knows why the rule is there, understands that it's important for everybody that there's a rule, and then integrates it into the self, and it becomes self-discipline. So now wherever they are, where there's a red light, there's a policeman or what, no policeman, they will do what should be done because it is already self-discipline. I think that's what we want to aim for. So the other thing about limits is this, no? knowing when to say no. Okay, That's very, very important in our culture because it's very, Am I right? It's very difficult for us to say no. Somehow, baka masaktan, or maybe underneath, baka hindi niya akong lapitan. There's also that self-concern, not just concern for the other person na masaktan, also a certain kind of concern. I won't be liked anymore, I won't be approached anymore, you know, that kind of thing. So I think we need to, what I call, we need to learn how to say a high-quality no. Okay. High quality no is a no that's not impulsive, not angry, because before, say, before answering, you think. It's similar to doing a mindfulness practice. No? So when you are asked a question, you're asked to do something, you don't say, say yes or no right away. You reflect, what am I feeling when they ask me this, what I want to do? So you become more... Uh, First of all, in control of your behavior and become aware of what's going on inside you and around you. I'm a mindfulness practitioner, so I really believe that uh, mindfulness is a very good practice wherein it is also emotional regulation. How do you regulate your emotion? When somebody tells you something, you're very, very angry, 
you, the impulsivity means uh, you anger, the emotion translates to behavior, action, angry action. But mindfulness is like emotional regulation wherein you're angry and you say to yourself, I'm aware that I'm angry. I'm angry because, you know, you own your anger, you process it before you do something about it. So there isn't, it's not impulsivity wherein the emotion leads to action, but the emotion leads to processing your mind, using your mind before you do the action. That's why mindfulness. So that's when we also know how to control our emotions and set limits. No? I'm sorry, I can do that tomorrow because right now I'm too tired. Things like that, no? which are very hard to do. But maybe we can start doing it, saying a high quality no, because we are aware and we own what we're feeling and we think before we act and not just say words that come out of our mouth and regret it later. When you're very, very upset or angry, pause and breathe. Right away, instantly your emotion will go, intensity will go down and you will calm your body. So, uh, doable, your breath is doable, it's always with you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, use it so that you become more able to set limits, to be able to be in control and not regret what you do. Okay, next please. Sense of competence, of course, everybody knows that in your definition of self, if I ask you who are you at this time in your life, at this age, when you give me an answer, I'm sure one of those answers will contain something that you know you are good at. In our definition of self, there must be something there that we know we are good at. It is a building block which will stand on as we go through life. No? There was a, here I go, there was a, a woman who was an editor of a woman's magazine. Uh, she came to me because she was feeling very vulnerable. This happens to us, no? You're feeling everything that's said about you, you feel it so much. There are times like that, no? Yeah, <laughs> when you're not strong enough to just take it, but parang it affects you. We have vulnerable times and we have to be aware and own it and it's normal. So she was very vulnerable and she said, every criticism of the magazine breaks her heart. I said, well, you're not gonna survive. You're gonna have a heart attack soon because of the nature of your work. Anyway, to make the long story short, she said that, at, what, where is it coming from? I asked her, why do you think you're like that? She said, when I was growing up, my mother who had a PhD was always putting me down. One side note, a PhD, unfortunately, or an MD or law degree doesn't make you necessarily a good person, unfortunately. Hopefully, our curriculum will come to the point where if you're a, great, uh, if you're a, a very good magna cum laude, you're also a good person, hopefully. <laughs> That's the total curriculum, not just the intellectual, okay? that's being developed. Not intellectual monsters who are immoral. No, we don't want to breed, <laughs> breed those <laughs> or intellectual executive who are emotionally retarded. We also don't want that. <laughs> they can read the ledger, know everything in one five minutes and then when they get home, they have no clue as to how their wives feel. That's very true. I've seen that. <laughs> so it's a lopsided development, okay? So I asked her, why are you like that? She said, because my, okay. She gave examples, but anyway, I said, but you know what? You're, you're an editor of a magazine, that's something. How did you get to that point, in spite of the put-downs of your mom? You know what she said, which I can never forget. When I was in grade school, I had a teacher who believed in me and who believed in my writing ability. So the teacher was able to recognize and make her aware of her sense of competence at something. And that was her, her, her standing, her rock that she stood on amidst all the negative things. So that she was able, she counted on her sense of competence in writing, that's why. She did. So it's very important for the teachers, for example, to uh, recognize the sense of the area of competence of the students. 
because sometimes you recognize only one area. You know? But there was a, a girl, for example, who was poor in reading. So everybody, everybody helped her. She got a reading tutor and audio something to supplement, and then the books, etc. Everybody was so helpful, so willing to help her. When I was talking to her, she said, I asked her, Hi, who are you? What's your name? Who are you? I am Anna. I am poor in reading. Because her, her self-concept was formed from that message that she got from the people who was always helping her. So I said, the self, you must open another door and identify what she's good at. So maybe she can say, I'm poor in reading, but I'm good in math. She can have something to be proud of. And I think that's very important in our work no? as teachers and in our lives as students. So it's also giving you a sense of power. When you know you can do something well, you are empowered. And therefore, you don't feel helpless. Yeah, so it's important to keep that in mind. And not just one area of competence, but what is the area of competence of that particular student? Recognize it, even if it's not, have nothing to do with what your exam or something like that. No? Knowing that's a basic psychological need at all levels. Okay, next please. Simple enough. Okay, very important, affiliation. The need to belong. This is very important related to what Richie said earlier, I was talking about earlier, the, the adolescents, the young people. Not just the young, I mean, 75, I want to need, I need to feel I belong. <laughs> and so the need to belong, to, but in, at the age of the young people, at the uh, teens and so on, the young um, millennials, etc. One of the most important things for them is to know that they belong to a group. They're accepted by the group. And one of the most painful things in bullying, for example, is to be rejected by the group that you want to belong to. It's a very basic need. In fact, in cyberbullying that Richie mentioned earlier, uh, and in bullying in, in the uh, class classroom, uh, one of the most painful things I've encountered, and this is a suicidal adolescent that came to me, a girl. There was a group of, it's a different kind of bullying, very subtle, the teacher may not notice it. The um, group of popular girls, three of them, uh, would be, you know, talking to each other. And then when she would go there and say hello, they'll just go like that. They won't say anything, they'll, they'll go look away. And then when she would, they were talking, and she walks in, they'll all be quiet and look at her. And then when, when she would say, hello, uh, may I join you? They will not even say anything, they'll walk away. She was telling me all these things and it totally destroyed her self-esteem and made her actually suicidal. That rejection no, of the peers who are important gives you such a painful experience for the young people, okay? And to have a support group, to have real friends. In fact, one of the uh, one of the uh, ways to cope with bullying. I just had an interview two weeks ago. One of the ways that we, with the group, now with the students, decided, agreed upon as one of the mo most effective ways of coping with bullying is to have at least one friend or two friends with you, so you're not alone. So you belong. You you connect. No? And I'd like to say, in the, maybe in an Eastern philosophical, <laughs> that's my mindfulness thing, is that we are all interconnected, and the interconnectedness of all human beings is the basis of compassion. You think of connectedness, think of a family, family system. In a family, especially the Filipino family, the joy or sorrow or pain of one member of the family inevitably affects everybody else, whether they like it or not, and because it's a system. So uh, it's really essential to know that. And in Tagalog, ang sakit ng kalingkingan, naram naman ng hiyong katawa. So belonging, belonging to a community, belonging to a group, having friends, and, and so on is very important. And being with, so we have the support group. When we, we do a lot of uh, 
psychosocial healing for traumatized disaster survivors. We've done a lot of that from the beginning until Yolanda, maybe almost all of the storms. And what we do is before we leave the place where we do the trauma therapy with them, we make sure that they have a support system. Maybe it's among the family, among the different families. Maybe it's the barangay, maybe it's the church, whatever it is, they have a support system before you leave them. Because that is most of the time how we all survive. Think about it. How do we, how have we survived? We have survived because of the help of other, pe other people, because of our relationships with other people, our connecting with other people. And I remember Pope Francis said to the little girl in Tacloban who asked him about a problem, I think it was abuse or a family problem, his answer was very much, uh, remem I remember this need. He said, uh, I cannot take away your pain, but I will be with you with my open heart. I will accompany you. You won't be alone. I will be there for you. So we all need this very, very, especially now. We all need this in our society now. We all need this to have a caring community to build in the schools. The, the essential antidote to bullying, aside from all the things you need to do, but essentially is to form a caring community. If you form a caring community in the school, bullying eventually or naturally lessens because there is a caring community. Wide scope of self-expression. We all need to have different ways of expressing our feelings, our emotions, and for one of the most important things to remember is never keep it within yourself. Keeping it within yourself, first of all, can make you sick physically ill, okay, but also it doesn't solve anything. No, so how do you deal with your emotions? You have to express them. And sometimes you do, cannot just express them in words. Sometimes words are too limited for it, deep emotions. So most of the time we do it through the arts. For children, it's through play. For adults, it's also through play, a different kind of play where you are. Anyway, play is just defined as the situation where you are free and safe to express what you are truly feeling in a certain form. Maybe through art, through play, through dance, through music. And that's how people from generation to generation have survived, to find a way of expressing themselves. Maybe I'll ask you, what is your way of expressing your deep emotion. You have to have a way. Do you talk to a best friend? Do you write in your journal? Yeah. Do you draw? Do you dance? So, drama. Diba hilig natin sa drama, no? That's one another way we express ourselves, through drama. Even in the disaster area, we, you know, when we have them uh, do their drama of what happened. It's a release. No? When you express yourself, you release emotions and don't keep them in. Okay? Even if you're very, very, very intense, you don't know what to do, talk to someone. Release, release. I just want to say something about play because that's my favorite thing. Uh, I also established the Philippine Association for Art and Play Therapy, which we have one now. We did the four researches on, on play for on children. Uh, Quezon City Vice Mayor then uh, Joy Belmonte wanted to make Quezon City a child-friendly city. So he, she asked us, a group of us, to do some work on that. But she asked me, How, what's a child-friendly city? I said, let us ask the children. So that's what we did. So we put in there, they, we collected their answers, and the first answer was, Ang child-friendly city ay isang lungsod na ang bata ay nakakapaglaro. It's a need no, that they have to express themselves. Then we did another one with UNICEF and AIM, a child-friendly schools. Ano ang child-friendly school? Ang child-friendly school ay isang paalala ng bata ay nakakapaglaro 
ang bata ay hindi sinasaktan at binubuli ng ibang bata. Ang, ang teacher ay hindi palaging galit, kaya natatakot ang bata pumasok. <laughs> That's their the three first answers. No? So, play and then teacher relationship. And then what's the other one? Oh, we also did work with uh, what your OFW in the book na walang ilong ng tahanan where the mothers were the OFWs because of the feminization of human of labor migration. No? So the first finding there was they were very very sad. Ang lungkot lungkot. Anong ginagawa niyo para ibsan ang lungkot niyo? Naglalaro po kami at nagahanap kami ng palaro. Pag naglalaro kami at nakikipaglaro, gumagaan ang loob namin. So, the play is essential. That's why when classrooms and when, when schools were re removing the playground, that's the worst move a school can do. No? But how do adults play? Adults must play. Teachers must play. Grandparents must play. And it's easier for us grandparents to play with our apple. But that you know, how do you play? You dance, you sing, but remember that you need to express yourself in the way that is comfortable for you. But it's a basic need. You don't keep your emotions inside you because that has very bad consequences for your health, physical and mental health. Transcendence. Okay, we all need right now even to know that there will be something better that things are going to the, the things that are happening to us that we are suffering from will pass that we have faith spiritually we have faith that uh, things will get better that there is a light at the end of the tan tunnel so to speak or that there is a the cloud every cloud to look I uh, use a cliche every cloud is a silver lining but to know that something beyond what's going on now will happen. To have hope, to have faith that I can transcend this. Madadaanan ko rin to. This will pass. That's very, very important, especially nowadays for our own lives and when we're working with people, with, child with children, with adolescents, with older people, and with people who have problems or with ourselves if you're undergoing something very difficult it's important to know that you will get to a point where you will be better because otherwise what will happen is you will get into a depression and when you get into a depression you will feel powerless so it's very important to have that it's a, both a need and a quality that we have, a characteristic that we have, transcendent. We are, we have transcended so much in our history as a people. So I think we can continue to transcend <laughs> and become better. But we can start with ourselves. How do I transcend? Anong pinagdadaan ko ngayon? I have faith na madadaanan ko to. Kaya kong daanan ito. With the help of people, with the help of my spiritual, with the help of your God, with the help of whoever your God is, and with the help of other people in your life. So we need to know that things will get better and believe and have faith. I added actually seven basic psychological needs. I added the one that I believe to be very important, which is the need for beauty. I had a talk called The Healing Power of Beauty. When you're very, very stressed, one thing you might want to do is look at something beautiful. If there is nature, ang ganda nga ng campus. In your campus, you go out there and look at the beautiful trees. That's one way. Doable, effective. When beauty is there, what happens? To, what does beauty do to us? No? When you see something beautiful, you pause. It makes you stop. It makes you look and become aware. Oops, it's beautiful. So, it, it's very, very important because when you are not touched by beauty anymore, you have to be very aware that you have to do something about it. Why? 
because maybe there are two main reasons why, why you are not touched by beauty. One is you have no time even to look at anything beautiful because you're too harassed and that's not the way to live, right? That's the most imbalanced way to live. You don't even have time to look at the trees and, in, and see how beautiful they are or, or a flower. You know? But the other thing is usually when people are not touched by beauty, they are depressed because if you don't see you see something, but it doesn't touch you in a way that makes you feel alive. Beauty makes you feel alive inside. So I think I'd add that as another basic need, especially the beauty of nature. Yes. Okay. And I think that's, that's the last need I have there. So thank you for your mindful listening.